Right, so I'm John Ashburner, and I'm going to be talking about pre-processing um, data for fMRI studies. And this is an overview of what I'll be covering. So there's three main sections. So I'm going to begin by explaining a few basic ideas that, um, that are relevant throughout the rest of the talk. Then I'll talk about within subject processing and then between subject processing. So most of the pre-processing for fMRI analysis is some form of image registration. Uh, and there are generally two components. So the first component involve, involves the registration itself where we need to optimize a number of parameters that describe a spatial transformation that maps images together. And then once we've estimated those parameters, then we can apply the transformation and resample um, our images according to the according to the transformation encoded by the estimated parameters. So one of the most basic types of image registration is uh, rigid body registration. So this assumes that the brains of uh, an individual don't change shape or size. Um, so the head can move, but the, the overall proportions re remain the same. Uh, there are some exceptions to this um, in that rigid registration doesn't account for image distortions. Uh, and there is a little bit of movement of the brain within the skull. Or if you've got longitudinal data, then there, there could be growth or atrophy over time. But generally, we can get quite a long way with just a rigid alignment for within subject processing. So rigid body registration is a kind of a subset, a special case of a more general affine registration. So in two dimensions, uh, so I start with 2D because it's easy to illustrate things. Uh, the new X coordinates, uh, do you see my cursor by the way? Or do, do I need a? Uh, yes, we can see it. Okay, so the new X coordinate is just the old X coordinate with some translation added and the same for the Y. Uh, and also do rotation. So if, if we rotate around an angle um, theta, uh, then the new X coordinate would be this function of the, of the angle and the original coordinates. And then there are zooms, um, which are not actually part of a rigid body transform, but we generally need to include zooms to account for isotropic voxel sizes and things. So these are just multiplying the, the old coordinates by some values. And then the shears. But all these operations can be conceptualized as uh, an affine matrix multiplication. So in the case of the translations, we've got an identity matrix uh, plus some offsets. Uh, for rotations, we've got this matrix of cosines and sines, etc. Uh, and this also applies in 3D, although it's a bit more complicated. So in three dimensions, we can parameterize a rigid body transform by six parameters. So there are three different directions that uh, an image can be translated in. And there are three axes about which the image can rotate. Uh, so we can construct uh, an AFAN transformation matrix by multiplying uh, a series of other matrices together. So we can take the translation matrix and the a matrix that encodes the pitch, the roll, the or, and multiply them together uh, to give us a, an AFAN transform matrix, which will do a rigid body uh, transformation. Uh, but note that the, the ordering of the operations does matter unlike in the 2D case. Um, within SPM and other nifty compatible software, there's also a concept of a, a voxel to world transform. So this is something that's encoded in the headers. So within the header of each nifty image, there's one, well, actually two uh, matrices encoded. 
the map from the indices of the voxels to some real world or, or MNI or Telerac coordinates. Um, and the way that these voxel to world transforms are loaded in SPM is that it assumes that the indices of the voxels go from one to N, uh, whereas other software would assume that the indices go from zero to N. But the, the actual headers are the same, it's just a, a slightly different um, representation internally. And when we do rigid body registration between two images, what actually happens is that there's an image that remains fixed, and then there's a moved image. And after the rigid body registration parameters have been estimated, the headers of the moved image are updated to encode the new positioning information. Uh, and if we take the, the voxel to world mappings from the headers, then we can use the, the voxel to world mapping from the first image to give world coordinates from voxel indices. And then we can use the inverse of the matrix uh, from the other image to map from these real world coordinates back into voxels in the other image. Uh, and this works kind of throughout many parts of SPM. Another concept uh, that you'll hear a bit about within the SPM course is um, optimization. So image registration involves estimating a set of parameters. And we define an objective function um, that we either maximize or minimize that encodes the how good the parameters are. And then we need to search for the parameters that give the, the best objective function. So if we had a single parameter, we could just do a, a simple grid search and just scan over a range of different parameters to see which one gives us the, the best solution. Um, with two parameters, this would be more time consuming because we'd have a 2D grid to search over. Uh, with six parameters, we'd have, we'd have to search over six dimensions, which would take absolutely ages with a grid search. So instead, what we do is something called a local optimization, where we assume we have some starting estimates that are reasonably close to the final solution. And then the optimization algorithm works out how to change its estimate of the parameters in order to improve the objective function. And it iterates over this, trying different different sets of parameter values until it can't improve the parameter values anymore. Uh, and we generally hope it's going to find the best overall solution. But depending where the algorithm starts, it might end up with a local optimum, uh, which we want to avoid. So this is one of the reasons why it's important that the images before you do anything to the images in SPM, you need to ensure that they're roughly already close to MNI space. So that's within, you know, say three to five centimeters and within about 20 degrees of ro rotation. Um, otherwise, all the various registration procedures have a greater chance of failing. Um, so you know many of the many of the questions I answer on the mailing list are simply due to poor starting estimates prior to uh, rigid body alignment or spatial normalization or whatever. But if you can get the original positioning reasonably good, then the algorithms in SPM have a much better chance of um, succeeding. Um, so there are tools in SPM um, that allow you to do manual orienting, manual reorienting of images. Um, yeah, so I mentioned objective functions as part of the optimization. So these are the things that you that we try to maximize or minimize. So from now on, I'll just refer to minimizing them. So. Well, within modality registration, 
Uh, minimizing the mean squares difference is quite a widely used um, objective function. So this gets used for rigid body alignment um, uh, when we're doing uh, motion correction of fMRI. Uh, we could also maximize the normalized correlation coefficient or, 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 or minimize the negative uh, normalized cor correlation. Um, and this, this would be a, another objective function that would work within modality. So this, these within modality objective functions assume that there's a simple relationship between the intensities in one image plotted against uh, the intensities in the other image in, in the corresponding locations. So what I've plotted here is a, a joint intensity histogram uh, taking one image, scanning through the voxels, finding the corresponding voxel in the other image, and just plotting um, their positions within this histogram. So if the intensity relationship is simple, then we can use uh, a within modality objective function. In practice, though, we, we often want to do registration between modalities in which case there isn't a nice simple relationship between the intensities. So instead we use objective functions uh, based on information theory or similar, such as um, we can minimize the negative mutual information or minimize the normalized uh, mutual information or, or sorry, minimize the negative normalized mutual information or, or, or minimize the negative of the entropy correlation coefficient. So these objective functions are based on the amount of structure within the joint intensity histogram. All right, so those are the, those were examples of objective functions that can be used. But when we move an image, we need to consider interpolation. Um, so if we move an image you know, by one voxel, then that's pretty straightforward. We don't need to interpolate. But if we move and if we translate an image by half a voxel, we would need to have, we'd need to figure out how to change the values in the, in the resliced version of the image. So the simplest way is just to take the, the closest neighboring the values of the closest neighboring voxels. But this isn't particularly good. So a slightly more complicated way is to use a, a trilinear interpolation. So this uh, figure illustrates um, this approach in 2D, which is a, a bilinear interpolation. So it's basically just taking a weighted, sorry, these, these white circles are the original voxels. And suppose we want the, the intensity here. What we can do is just compute a weighted average of this voxel and this voxel to give this and a weighted average of this voxel and this voxel to give this value. And then we can do a weighted average of these two to give us our estimate of the intensity. Um, but this is not entirely optimal either. And uh, I'd forgotten that this slide wasn't working, sorry. Um, I hate PowerPoint sometimes. Um, so trilinear interpolation is from a family of interpolation methods uh, called B-spline interpolation. So trilinear interpolation is equivalent to a first degree B-spline interpolation. Uh, and what these approaches do is parameterize images as linear combinations of lo very local basis functions. So for, trial for bilinear interpolation, a basis function centered it at each voxel would look like this. And we can fit the whole image to this set of basis functions. And then we can reconstruct the, the intensities between the centers of voxels by taking the appropriate linear combination of the values of the basis functions at, at, at those points. 
but this idea kind of extends so we can use high degree interpolations that use more neighboring voxels and give nicer interpolations. Um, so this is an overview of how I view the pre-processing for fMRI. So we start off with an fMRI time series, uh, but the subject may have moved in the scanner. So we can do some kind of rigid body alignment to correct for head movement within the scanner. Often we also acquire an anatomical scan of the same subject and it's useful to have the anatomical scan in alignment with the fMRI data. So we can do a co-registration between one of the fMRI scans or, or say the average of the fMRI, fMRI scans uh, with the anatomical uh, to give us a, an AFAN transformation matrix, which can be incorporated into the header of the anatomical MRI. Um, and we can use the anatomical scan to estimate how to warp the fMRI data to MRI space. So we have some kind of, some form of template data and we figure out how to deform the template data so that it is overlaid onto the anatomical MRI. And this will give us um, an estimate of a deformation field. And this deformation field should be applicable to the anatomical MRI to enable it to be uh, spatially normalized. But also because the anatomical MRI and the fMRI are registered, it can also be applied to the fMRI data. Uh, and that allows us to get spatially normalized versions of the fMRI, which, which we can then smooth and then do some kind of statistical analysis or DCM or whatever you plan to do to the data. Uh, so the first part of the talk will be about this within subject processing. These, sorry, the next part of the talk will be about this within subject processing, uh, which is all, or which is mostly all um, rigid body alignment. So we've got the motion correction and the co-registration. So start, starting with the realignment, uh, so if we've got a series of fMRI scans, uh, we can consider one of the scans or the average of the scans as a, as a reference and then figure out how to move the individual fMRI volumes to best match um, the reference uh, and estimate a set of six parameters for each of the volumes um, in order to kind of minimize the, the mean squares difference. Um, among the images. Uh, so we can visualize this in terms of the image, sorry, the, 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 the joint intensity histograms of the images. So if two images of the same modality are not aligned and we construct a joint intensity histogram, we might see something like this. After alignment, there should be a, a nice simple relationship between the intensities where one image is reasonably well modeled by the other image with a bit of Gaussian noise added to it. So this is the assumption behind the mean squares difference um, objective function. Uh, so we can do the motion correction uh, or, or the realignment, and this will give us a set of six parameters for each volume. Uh, and at the end of the, the, the realignment, uh, it gives a plot of the estimated motion for in terms of the six, uh, sorry, in terms of the three translation parameters and three rotation parameters. And after motion correction, you can check to see if it's been effective by using the check rate button, uh, which has a browse option which allows you to see a series of images as a, as a movie. Uh, 
So you can just scroll through the images to see if the you know, motion appears to have been corrected. So the motion correction is not perfect. Um, it is, it does make a number of assumptions. Uh, so the interpolation may not be perfect, uh, particularly if we just use trilinear interpolation. If we use higher degree in B-spline interpolation, uh, we can reduce the, the errors from uh, interpolation. But sometimes, you know, if there are gaps between slices, then there's no signal collected uh, in parts of the brain. So we can't reconstruct what signals should be um, after motion correction. Uh, so this can cause what's known as aliasing effects. Um, another one is that the motion correction assumes that the head, sorry, that the yeah, head and brain moves as a rigid body um, object. But the data are acquired slice-wise, or they're usually acquired slice-wise. So slices at the top of the head might be acquired first, and then you scan down and you get the slices at the bottom of the head. And if the head move, if the subject moves their head between acquiring the top slice and the bottom slice, then the motion isn't going to be rigid. The motion that you see in the images isn't rigid. So the, the rigid body alignment model would not be ideal uh, for that situation. So if a subject sneezes, the motion correction is not going to do a particularly good job for those parts of the data. And also, there are a few artifacts in fMRI scans, uh, in particular, for many images, there's um, uh, a distortion in the phase encode direction. Um, and this distortion is not probably corrected by rigid body alignment. Uh, and there are also patterns of dropout and, and ghosting artifacts sometimes. And these artifacts don't move in the same way as the, as the head. Um, and when we're doing the um, alignment, slight changes in bold signal can influence our estimates of the motion parameters. So suppose we're doing a, a visual study uh, and we have an increase in signal at the back of the brain, then the estimated motion parameters might move the brain slightly forward during the um, uh, during the uh, stimulation periods. So the actual estimated parameters will be slightly influenced by the uh, by the by the tasks. Um, it's possible to include estimated motion parameters as confounds in your linear modeling, which we'll come to later. Uh, but be aware that if there are slight changes in, in uh, the estimated motion parameters due to the task, then regressing out the estimated motion parameters may regress out some of your actual task signal. Um, so here I mentioned image, dis image distortion uh, being something that's not solved by a, a pure rigid body alignment model. Um, but a while ago, Jesper Anderson developed some uh, extensions to SPM to try to deal with uh, distortions in fMRI a little bit better. Um, and also, there's a field map toolbox that allows a, a measure. It, it allows um, a, a kind of distortion field to be um, included within the uh, motion correction model. So, um. MRI uh, 
is influenced by the susceptibility of the sorry the magnetic something called the magnetic susceptibility of different tissue types so the magnetic susceptibility of soft tissue is quite different from that of air and these differences in susceptibility can lead to slight very small distortions of the magnetic field and these distortions of the magnetic field can result in signal appearing in slightly the wrong place so with many epi images uh, in in the phase and code direction these distortions can kind of lead to the front of the brain being squished backwards or forwards uh, depending on the kind of acquisition settings um, but if we try to estimate the distortion field we can kind of correct some of these distortions so the current way of doing that within SPM is using the, uh, the um, field map toolbox. Uh, we're also working on some new, or working on a, a re-implementation of uh, what's known in FSL as top up. So there'll be a, a kind of SPM version of top up that can be used for um, estimating distortion fields. Um, so yeah, the field map toolbox, this is the, the current approach. Uh, and the idea is to acquire a few more images that can be used to estimate a voxel displacement map that can be used to correct for distortions in the echo planar images. Uh, and where the field map toolbox is most likely to go wrong, apart from kind of users entering the wrong settings, etc is in something called the phase unwrapping. And this is because we need to estimate some kind of angles from complex data. Uh, so if the, if we had, if this black line was the, the real, uh, you know, was, 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 was the angle that we would hoping to get, uh, Uh, which kind of exceeds the 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 um, you know pi to minus pi range. Um, the angles in the data are only in this uh, minus pi to pi range. So phase unwrapping involves trying to take the original data and kind of stitch it together in a way that makes it continuous. So with the with the the phase wrapped angles, we might have a map like this. And phase unwrapping would be to try to would involve trying to reconstruct something like this. So this bit can go wrong if the signal is very noisy. So that's just something to watch out for. Um, so SPM has the option to try to estimate uh, head motion by distortion interaction. So this little model tries to kind of illustrate what might cause the differences in in head shape due to orientation of the head. So this background field has these red blobs that indicate a distortion downwards uh, and the blue blobs would dis indicate distortion upwards. So if we have the head, or in this case, an ellipse oriented like this, we may have distortions as indicated by these arrows. If the head rotates, the distortions will be the distortions from the same field would be in a slightly different direction um, and these blue lines try to indicate what the what the distorted image would look like um, in the two cases and as you can see if if this image was ro rotated back to this orientation these lines would no longer match each other 
uh, and that would be a, a movement a movement by distortion interaction which kind of shows that was a very subtle effect in fMRI signals uh, but if you use the the correction within SPM then it should take out much of the um, uh, this artifact from the motion corrected data. Uh, so this would be the real line and then warp option. Um, and what it basically tries to do is estimate a map of what the distortions are in proportion to the amount of rotation around certain angles. So there could be a, a, a map of the amount of distortion with respect to pitch and a map of the amount of distortion with respect to roll. And then we can take the, the, the pitch and roll parameters and reconstruct the distortion map by weighting the, this one field by one parameter, then adding it to the other field multiplied by the other parameter. And the idea is that that should reduce the distortion effects or the, the interactions between head motion and distortion. Um, so the way it's generally done is we estimate the movement parameters as usual. So this is just the realignment within fMRI. Uh, and then estimate a, a reference from what, the mean of all the images. And then use a, an optimization procedure to try to estimate the amount of distortion with respect to to the um, to the actual estimated movement parameters. Uh, so we try to estimate these maps. Uh, this is an iterative procedure. And then at the end, we hope we can model out most of the uh, distortion, sorry, the, the movement by distortion interaction effects. Uh, and now the, so that was for the fMRI time series by themselves. So just, just correcting head motion and distortion within the fMRI time series. Uh, this is a bit about um, aligning the fMRI to the anatomical scans, uh, which is useful because it, it allows the, you know, in, in a single subject study, it allows blobs to be superimposed on a, on a slightly better quality image. Uh, but it also allows the anatomical images to be used to estimate more precise alignment of the subject scans. And between modality registration, uh, by definition, is, is not within modality. So there's no simple relationship between the intensities in one image and those in another. Um, so the, uh, the idea might be to minimize the negative mutual information or the, or the negative uh, normalized mutual information. So if images aren't aligned, we can plot the joint intensity histogram of a T1 weighted and a T2 weighted, and we can see it's a bit of a blurry mess. After alignment, there should be more structure. So that in principle, after alignment, given, given some knowledge of um, uh, the intensity of voxel in one image, we should be able to predict something about the intensity um, of the corresponding voxel in another image. Whereas prior to alignment, this is less effective. Um, so after registration, uh, there's, you can use the, the check reg option of SPM to see how well it's worked. Uh, so there's an option to um, derive contours from one of the images uh, and superimpose those on the other image. And that gives you a visual idea of how effective the registration has been. But note that the, you know, there may be dropouts and distortions in the echo planar images that don't align well with the structural data. But for the sake of the, um, the actual rigid alignment, it's important that the distortions are corrected. Otherwise, there's not a good match between the structural scans and the functional data. So if you estimate spatial normalization parameters from the structural scans, they're less effective when you apply them to the 
uh, functional data. So these are some references for that. Right, so visiting the overall pipeline to the fMRI time series, uh, we described the motion correction and, and the some of the EPI distortion correction. Uh, the co-registration between anatomical data and um, fMRI. Uh, spatial normalization to a common set of template data. Um, or the fMRI to give the spatially normalized versions and then we eat smooth. So the next part of the talk is about this bit. So the first part was about the within subject stuff. So all the registration was within subject. Uh, and that is generally done first. Uh, and it's about ensuring that all the scans within subject are in alignment with each other. This next part is for dealing with uh, between subject variability. So it's about warping, being able to warp all the data from one subject into a common space. And note, it's also possible to do things this way. So sometimes it, it can be more effective to um, align the fMRI data to template space. And that's a, a slightly simpler way of doing it, uh, but the effectiveness will depend on many factors, such as the amount of contrast in your fMRI, and also the amount of distortion in the fMRI. So if the fMRI data are very distorted, then they're not gonna be aligned well with the anatomical data, and you know, and estimating uh, precise deformations from the anatomical data and applying them to fMRI data that are not aligned with the anatomical isn't going to be as effective. Um, so if you've got very distorted fMRI, but with relatively, relatively little in the way of dropout and good contrast, then this might be the way to, to do things and just estimate the warps from the fMRI. Right, so between subject spatial normalization, um, the way it's done now is that it uses the same uh, mechanism as the segmentation in SPM. Uh, and the objective is to bring the brains of different subjects into the common anatomical space. Uh, and it's done by matching gray matter with gray matter, white matter with white matter, and so on. So it identifies the gray and white matter in the individual subject's data, uh, and that gets aligned to the, uh, the template maps of gray and white matter. Um, so yeah, as I said, um, what's underneath the normalized button is the same basic algorithm as what's underneath the segment button. Uh, and the way it's done is that it combines a mixture of Gaussians or a Gaussian mixture model to, that encodes the intensity distributions of the different tissue types with an intensity non-uniformity correction and non-linear warping. And all this is combined into the same model in order to try to achieve a, a decent match uh, or a decent estimate of the non-linear warps that would uh, enable the data to be spatially normalized. Uh, so if we have an image, uh, we want to be able to warp a set of tissue probability maps to this image, and then we can invert the, the, the nonlinear transformation uh, in order to warp the image to match the tissue probability maps. <laughs> Um, so, as I said, the, the warping is done by identifying gray matter in the image. So we can align these tissue map, tissue probability maps to the, to the gray matter, uh, and also identify the white matter in the image. So we can use the, the white, in, white matter information to drive the registration and the, the CSF information and so on. 
and So if we consider the approach for identifying grey matter and white matter, it's partly done based on the um, image intensity. Uh, so if we plot a profile of the image intensity along this green line, we get a plot like this. Uh, so this region here is kind of grey matter, no, uh, in white matter which is gives us this white matter bump and then we go through a bit of gray matter where the signal goes down and so on and then we get to the ventricles here where the signal is lower and the model assumes that the intensity of the white matter is fairly uniform and the intensity of the gray matter is fairly uniform and the intensity of the csf is fairly uniform and so on um so if we take an image, we can look at the intensity distribution of the different tissue types. Um, so for a T1 weighted image, the white matter intensity would be this, uh, this green distribution and the gray matter CSF and then other intensity distributions. Um, so the, the segmentation in SPM kind of models these intensity distributions using a Gaussian mixture model. So it's like a, a positive weighted sum of Gaussian distributions to, to model this actual intensity distribution. Um, so consider these, these yellow bars would be a histogram of an intensity distribution and we can fit a positive linear combination of Gaussians, each one shown in this blue, add them together and that will model the overall intensity distribution. And the model also makes use of these tissue prize or, the, or, or these maps that get warped to the individual subject. Um, so in SPM 12 we have these tissue maps, so we've got grey matter, white matter, CSF, bone roughly, uh, soft tissue and air. And if these tissue maps are overlaid on the image that we're uh, segmenting and spatially normalizing, then that can help with identifying the different tissue types. Uh, so if we have a, a T1 weighted image, then we can identify the different tissue types. Uh, but identifying the tissue types requires the image to be in reasonable alignment with the tissue prize uh, but then the objective is to the overall ob objective is to kind of get this alignment so there's a, a kind of iterative scheme where we identify the different tissue types and then use those to uh, improve the alignment re-identify the tissue types and so on and keep iterating um, until the approach uh, can't improve the alignment any better there's also, um, yeah, so uh, the way the relative shapes are encoded uh, are we have a set of displacements uh, vertically and horizontally, uh, and we'd have a number of parameters that encode uh, these, these, um, these maps of displacement, and we want to estimate the parameters. Uh, so we've got yeah, we've got a vertical and horizontal displacement map. Uh, these can be combined together to give us a kind of deformed grid. And then if we consider straightening up the grid, then that would give us a deformed version of the tissue probability map. And the idea would be to estimate the parameters that kind of give our deformed version of the tissue probability map that is as close as possible to the um, gray matter map or white matter map or whatever from the from the image that we're trying to align. Um, also in SPM there, there is a bias correction within this. So a common artifact with um, fMRI is a, a kind of image intensity non-uniformity. So we also have a few parameters for kind of modeling a bias field that if we multiply the original image by the bias field, we get a corrected version. Um, 
So this bias field is modeled as a linear combination of basis functions. And then we'd have a coefficient for each of these basis functions that we'd want to estimate. And then we just add up a linear combination of them weighted by the coefficients uh, to give us a kind of estimate of the of the bias or in intensity noise uniformity. Um, but yeah, I also take an exponential just to ensure that things remain positive. So as I briefly said, it's a kind of iterative scheme. Uh, so we have many parameters that control different things. So we have a, a bunch of parameters that, that, that model the intensity distributions of the tissues. Uh, we have a bunch of parameters for the bias fields. Uh, and we have a bunch of parameters that encode deformations. And we kind of keep iterating, updating all the parameters, uh, repeating everything many times until we reach convergence. And then we hope that at the end of it, we've got you know good estimates of the spatial normalization parameters. Um, so the normalized segment option gives quite crude um, nonlinear registration. Uh, we can get rather better uh, or rather more accurate nonlinear alignment using Dartle or Shoot, um, which I won't go into, into in too much depth, but it basically uses a slightly different approach for representing the relative shapes of the images. And it uses um, a, a many, many, many parameters to encode the relative shapes. Um, so yeah, the idea is to kind of achieve a one-to-one -one mapping uh, between images uh, with very flexible nonlinear deformations. So within the unified segmentation, with, within the default spatial normalization approach, it has a relatively inflexible model for aligning images. Whereas we can use a more flexible model if we constrain it to be a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, and the, the way that's done in shoot is that it gives, it starts off by giving us a very small displacement field, which we can warp with itself to give a, a slightly bigger displacement field or deformation field. And then we can warp that with itself to give a bigger one, warp that with itself to give a bigger one, and so on, until we can start seeing visual differences. So if you warp that with itself, we get that. Repeat it, we get that. And then we end up with a final deformation. So we can generate quite large deformations by repeatedly warping very tiny deformations with themselves. And very tiny deformations are generally one-to-one -one mappings. And if we warp a one-to-one -one mapping with a one-to-one -one mapping, we end up with a one-to-one -one mapping and so on. Um, the way that Dartle and the shoot toolboxes work is that they uh, match gray matter with gray matter, white matter with white matter and so on. And the objective function includes a matching term, uh, which actually drives the alignment of the images and a regularization term that keeps things slightly smooth and there's a, a kind of trade-off between these terms. Uh, and the, the form of the trade-off will influence slightly the, the, the nature of the estimated deformations. So as an example, uh, if we have a shape like this and a shape like this, we can warp um, uh, this shape to match this one uh, with different types of penalty on the, on the smoothness and they might give very visually similar estimated warps. But the actual warps themselves have quite different properties. So this is something to bear in mind slightly for anyone that's um, planning to use registration to estimate maps of uh, volume change. So yeah, so the idea within Dartle and Shoot is that uh, it simultaneously matches all the gray matter together from a bunch of subjects and all the white matter together from a bunch of subjects. So it starts by creating a, a template of 
uh, gray matter average and white matter average for all the subjects, aligns the images slightly closer to this uh, template, recreates the template and keeps iterating um, until convergence. Um, so an initial average template with a little bit of smoothing might look like this. So we have the gray matter template, white matter template. After a few iterations, we'll have something slightly crisper. Uh, and then at the final iteration, we hope to have something much crisper. Uh, so this is a, just a, an A fine average of a, a bunch of gray matter maps. Uh, and that's a nonlinear average. So this A fine average is uh, one of the old, it, it's the old 452 subject um, uh, tissue map from the MNI. And this is a population uh, average of 471 subjects. And you can see that the, the average is a bit crisper, but also it's slightly smaller than the MNI average. And that's because MNI space is bigger than you know real brains. Uh, this kind of just illustrates that the, the deformations are you know not so excessive. Uh, then 471 subject average, um matter, white matter, um that's an average of the of the brains. And that's a single subject walk to that space. So we can toggle between the average of the, of the population and the single individual. And in general, it doesn't do too badly. Some bits fail a little bit. So just watch that area there and this area here for different subjects. Um, so that's the average. This is another subject. So this bit's messed up a bit, but you know, in general, it's, it's, it's got quite a good alignment. And another subject. Um, in terms of validation of DARTL, uh, there was a paper by Anno Klein et al. Uh, that looked at validation of different alignment methods. Uh, and DARTL, it wasn't among the top performing for one data set. So it was about here for this data set. Did well for other data sets um, in this paper. Uh, and the one that came out best from this study was um, from the, the ANTS approach. Um, but after redoing the validation on the same data set and not using skull strip data, the, um, the DARPL method uh you know outperformed ants um and all the other methods in terms of um ability to align one subject to another subject according to overlaps of manually defined regions um so yeah we're almost at the end so we've covered the between subject alignment aka spatial normalization uh, using either the, uh, the the normalize option, or we could use the the segment option and then DARTL uh, to spatially normalize our images. And then the final step is to account for kind of imperfections in the spatial normalization, um, and that is to just smooth the preprocessed fMRI. So. The smoothing is done by a convolution operation. So we convolve the images by a Gaussian, but I'll just illustrate convolution uh, using a, a different shape function. Uh, so this is convolved with like a circular function. So if we take this pattern of <coughs> uh, ones and zeros and convolve it with a circular function, we get them up like this. So this can be seen as giving a, an average uh, number of dots uh, within each region of the convolved image. But in practice, we would use a, a Gaussian, uh, which will give us a, a kind of weighted average, a local weighted average of the signal within each region of the image. <laughs>
And we can convolve all of the images by different amounts. So here, the original images might look like this, and then we can convolve with them. Um, we can smooth it a little bit by convolving with a, uh, a Gaussian with a relatively small full width half maximum, or we can smooth more. Um, normally, we smooth by, you know, about eight, in the region of eight millimeters. So that's, that's the most common amount. Um, and then after smoothing of the aligned fMRI, it's all pre-processed and then you can move on to the next steps of the processing. And that's me done. Thank you very much.